back to the one iron. Today starts off our series titled Everything About Golf. Uh, what we're going to do here is just go over topics that you know beginners would like to know about, advanced players want more information about. So every Thursday we're going to do these podcasts. Um, today's uh, topic is going to be the dress code. Uh, we'll get more into that, but so every Thursday we're going to do these. I'm going to put them out on uh, our regular distribution, which is on pod, or any podcast service. So Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, Google Podcast, uh, Stitcher, anything that you use now, you'll be able to hear it. But I'm also going to put it on YouTube, and I'll put the channel link in the description. Uh, sometimes you just need graphics to explain how things work. And, uh you know, they're visual learners, so I want to make sure that everybody understands what's going on and can, you know, see it mentally and just hear it as well. So we'll start today out with the uh, golf dress code. Uh, we'll see how, you know, the golf attire has changed over the ages. And uh, so the first thing we're going to do is see why there was dress code implemented in the first place, if there was one, and why. Um, we're going to see how it progressed through the times. Uh, then we'll see, you know, where we are now, how things can change. Do we need a dress code? And then we'll talk about like some of the female biases and some issues, issues that have currently happened in the media. Um, but yeah, and then lastly, we're going to wrap up since this is Thursday, the PGA tour is going on right now. So we have the WGC. Uh, concession in Bradenton, and then we also have the uh, Puerto Rico Open, great week, and then we have the LPGA at the Gamebridge, so we're going to take a look at all those. Uh, so if you are listening to this after February 25th, 2021, then you can just stop as soon as we're done talking about the dress code, or you can listen in to see how we look over Thursday's field and think about what's going to happen the rest of the weekend. So let's dive into the dress code. Um, we're going to begin where golf was originated. And you know, there's some speculation on whether or not the Scots created it or if it was created before them. Uh, we just have to remember that it started out as a ball and stick game. And all over Europe, Asia, and Africa in the 13th century, there's evidence of ball and stick games being played. Now, going into the 15th century, we can definitely say that the Scots took this ball and stick game and actually made it a sport. They turned it from, hey, let's hit this pebble, to, hey, there's a hole, let's hit it in that hole, and then let's have another hole. So they started off by naming it. You have to name something that you're playing. So they used um, golf, G-O-U-F-F, -F, or G-O-F-F. -F. I've seen it spelled both ways. And they say it's translated from the Dutch word kolf, which means club. Uh, the Dutch and the Scots had a big trading uh, scheme going on so that they, their economy was basically them trading back and forth. So it was huge trading going on. So they used language back and forth, Dutch and Scots, and uh, that's how they determined that this was a Dutch word. It was kolf, uh, which meant club, and then they just named it golf. So, now that we have the name figured out, we also know that the Scots were in a very interesting climate. You know, the weather was you know, very windy, rainy, cold. Uh, so, when you're outside for three hours, what do you think you're going to be wearing? <laughs> you're going to be wearing something that's warm, something that can handle rain. Uh, so, they ended up wearing knickers and, you know, short pants that then were covered up with like knee-length socks and heavy tweed jackets to get them through their three-hour rounds. Interestingly enough, you'll also see players wearing neckties and tweed caps. And up until 1457, golfers would dress this way. They would, you know, go out and have a grand old time, and that was that. But for a brief time, the Scottish monarchy banned golf I think it was from 19, or 1457 to 1491, they banned golf. And that was just because they thought that the common folk were spending way too much time on the golf course, and they needed to be focusing their time on uh, military practices and learning arch or fine-tuning their archery skills. So during that time, the rich and the 
royalty were able to continue playing and they would push the golf attire to its limit. They were able to spend more money on what they were wearing. So they looked presentable, very nice. Um, there's also a, there's a picture of the Mary Queen of Scots when she was playing in the 16th century, and uh, she was all dolled up, and you know she can because she's the, she's a queen. So uh, this it was also said that Mary Queen of Scots was not a golfer, but there's a picture of her golfing. So who knows? Uh, then we'll begin to see golf spread in the 18th century. It, it came over to the U.S. Uh, it's pre it was prevalent in New York, Carolinas, and Georgia because there are British and Scottish communities based there. Uh, there are documents from ships of manifestos of, uh, or well, not a manifest of the manifests that show ledgers that have people sending golf balls and golf clubs from Scotland over to the U.S. I think the earliest they found was in 1739. And then uh, they also had in 1743, there's one that says uh, they sent 432 golf balls and 96 golf clubs shipped from Scotland to Charleston. So pretty cool. The game began to grow. Um, as the game grew, the attire obviously had to change. Uh, we're not playing in Scotland right now. We're playing in the United States. There's a different climate. So if we skip to the 1900s, Golfers were now wearing single-breasted jackets, plus fours, as they call them. They're pants. They're extra length. They're like four inches long, obviously, plus four. And what they would do is they would take their socks and they would roll it up, put their socks over top of the pants, and then the pants would create like a hem, and a flap would basically hang over the socks. So you see it in old-time baseball players. They do it. Um, they're still wearing neckties and flat caps along with knitted cardigans. Still trying to stay warm, still using thick clothes. Um, they would begin to have two-toned shoes, uh, you know, kind of like your bowling shoes. They're, two, they're black and white. Uh, they became popular in the 1920s. It was known as the spectator shoe. Uh, the amount of material these guys wore was crazy. I mean, how could you possibly swing a golf club uh, it was like remarkable the fact that they could still swing a golf club freely and there's no I mean I hate having a hoodie on I'd rather be wearing you know short sleeves but in the 1930s uh, they begin to phase out the plus four pants and they turned to you know flannel pants <laughs> they were now in the mix so they still had neckties but um, they were phasing out um, it was becoming more like the sport was becoming more approachable more relaxed the 40s and 50s, we began to see players wear khakis and colored fabrics. In the 70s, you'll start to see turtlenecks, and you'll see brown pants and distinguishable golf shirts. So like shirts, you would see somebody wearing a golf shirt and be like, hey, that's a golf shirt. They're not like, hey, that's your everyday shirt that you put on this morning. And then we introduced the houndstooth patterns. You know, <laughs> the 70s was great for golf, basically. Uh, then we move on into the 90s where sponsor, you know, sports sponsors started to pick up. We have uh, logos on sports clothes. Like we have the, uh, Nike started putting their logo. We have Tommy Hilfiger. Uh, you know, we have visors now. <laughs> Instead of just hats, we have golf visors. Um, I mean, they're still being worn to this day. Bubba will wear a visor. Uh, as we, you know, approach the current point in time, golf is just going crazy. Uh, it's it's different we, you know we have golfers out here wearing like like this under armor thin clothing compared to these tweed jackets that they used to wear you know I mean, it's just crazy Nike's even pushing the golf entire to a new limit they're going with their mock turtleneck which doesn't even have a, a collar you know it's a mock collar uh, you know PGA Tour they have the it's in their rule book that says you have to have a a collar so you know tiger gets to do whatever he wants um, we also start to see you know the rna is loosening up their regulations and this is for the european tour you know when you go to the, the open now you're able to play your practice rounds wearing shorts that used to not be a thing at all you'd have to wear pants every round um, so you know the rna is relaxing their rules hopefully the usj will do the same uh, there's a significant boom going on in the golf apparel company. I mean, you can pretty much find 
anything and everything, like crazy designs, Hawaiian designs. It's just awesome to see this boom of clothing and art. Like, you can't go wrong. Right now is the time to be in the golf apparel game. But hopefully the PGA Tour will keep up with the uh, apparel game and we'll be able to wear whatever the heck we want. <laughs> so when did the first dress code come to, to fruition? Well, who knows? I mean, to be honest, there really isn't a dress code that fits every course. Every course is able to put together whatever policy they want. Um, the Royal Old Golf Club, or the RNA. Uh, doesn't have a specific dress code for every single course. They just have a dress code for the European Tour players when you're playing on a European Tour event. Same way with the PGA Tour. USGA has a dress code policy for PGA Tour events for PGA Tour players. Other than that, it's just whatever the golf course wants to be their policy. So it's pretty much at their discretion. Um, the course that the RNA is pretty much is tied to is St. Andrews, the old course. Uh, they obviously have established their dress code policy. It's been there since 1754. And you'll find it's pretty, uh, it's not too strict, but it's pretty strict. Uh, I'll add the link to the dress code policy into the description. So you can check that out. Uh, you know, you can't wear sweatpants. You can't wear hoodies. You can't wear shirts without a collar. You can't wear sports shorts. You can wear shorts, but you can't wear workout shorts or you can't wear jerseys. Um, they recently introduced the ability to wear jeans on Fridays, which is pretty cool. I mean, everybody should have, I think everybody has jeans or has the ability to get a pair of jeans. Uh, but the biggest one that's pretty cool is they don't allow cell phones on the course, which is awesome. I mean, everybody wants to enjoy a game of golf. It's relaxing. Without a phone, it's even more relaxing. I know I use my phone sometimes for yardage books, but, or for yardage, but when you're at the old course, just play. Why not? Enjoy the atmosphere. Uh, they do have designated areas throughout the clubhouse that you can wear or you can use your phone, but I mean, it's pretty awesome to be able to say, hey, yeah, I went and played a round of golf and I didn't even have my phone on me. It's pretty awesome. I love it. But yeah, so every golf course has their own set of policies. You can just go to, typically you can go to the website and look it up. If not, call. I mean, if you're really worried about it. If you're going to a public golf course, I'd say you're fine wearing jeans. Like, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. Um, shorts are great in the summertime. Everybody loves wearing shorts. Uh, I wouldn't try, I would try not to wear sweatpants, but if you're going to a public course, I doubt they're going to turn you away for wearing sweatpants. I mean, if you're coming and you're paying, you're a paying customer, they're going to take you. Your private courses might turn you away. Uh, I mean, some of them have pretty strict dress code policies. So just make sure if you're going to a private course, you obviously are probably gonna go as a guest if you're a beginner, because I would, I surely hope that a beginner does not have, I mean, doesn't have a membership to a private golf course, but you might, who knows. Um, yeah, so just look it up. I mean, go to a web, their website, golf course website. There should be a dress code policy. If there isn't, then you should be fine wearing <laughs> anything that you would wear if you're, like, going to go take a a portrait or, you know, or, you know, you're looking good going out to the bar or if you're going to go to school or something like that. I mean, <laughs> you should be fine. So... Now that we know that there are no dress codes specifically for golf in general, everybody should be able to go play. I mean, we want this to be approachable. It's supposed to be an approachable game, sport that everybody could play, enjoy. But is there a bias towards uh, women golfers? I 100% think there is. And I think that it mostly has to do with, you know, remarks that people make. But we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, Let's look back and see, like, the 1946 Women's U.S. Open, Patty Berg won that, right? She was wearing a wool skirt that went down to her shoes and this bulky sweater. I couldn't even imagine walking 18 holes wearing a wool skirt, let alone being able to swing. 
I, it's just remarkable that she's able to to do that. But not only did she walk 18 holes, but she actually played and she won. <laughs> so props to her. Beyond me, how she did it, but she did it. And then in 1967, at the next U.S. at their, that U.S. Open, we have Catherine Lacoste won it. She's wearing a knee-length skirt. Uh, I mean, we're progressing here, right? We went from down to the shoes, down to the knee to the knee length now. Uh, little Nugget, uh, she is related to Lacoste, who is the clothing brand. They were actually the first people to make polos for men's golf. Ironically, they didn't make it for women's golf from, at first. That's pretty weird. Seeing how she won the 1967 U.S. Open. So they made polos for men. Uh, we move on into the 80s when we get to see pleated shorts and form-fitting pants, which is, again, we're progressing. But there are still no major golf apparel brands sponsoring women's golf, which is sad to see. Uh, the 90s led way to Ralph Lauren, who began to make uh, women's golf clothes specifically for women, not just, you know, skinnier or smaller pants and smaller shirts that were designed for men. These are actually, they were specifically made for women, which is... You know, that's the 90s. It's still behind the times. Uh, you would usually see khaki pants with oversized, pol oversized polos. Um, now in the 2000s, we have this tech the technology now to you know have breathable clothing. Uh, everything is so advanced that you, it's remarkable what you could you could wear. I mean, it led to a huge boom in the women's golf fashion. Uh, then we had in 2017 the P LPGA. They have a pretty relaxed dress code policy, but in 2017 they put, um, you know, they put in a policy for length of the skirts. As they said in their regulations, it says it has to cover the bottom area. And they restricted plunging necklines, and they required collared shirts. We have Rudy Giuliani so, who made you know, a crazy comment it's not on too crazy a talk show. Of Dress code uh, about Michelle Wee and what bad. she was wearing. I mean, uh, he made a comment. There was some backlash. It's, it's, it's something that he's continued to make I think that everything has settled down now. It's about the biggest how issue is that we have Michelle Wee in 2015. And at that time, she was doing the 90-degree uh, bend for her putting stance. So basically, when she went up to putt, she would legit bend her back 90 degrees and putt. I mean... It worked for her. She ended up winning a women's U.S. Open, and she had a great season. I mean, you do what you got to do to win, right? But he made a comment about he made a lewd comment about her bending over and about the clothes that she was wearing, and it's just ridiculous. Like he he's not commenting on her skill. He's not commenting on her game. He's just talking about what she looks like, and it's just inappropriate. Uh, I mean, if you're going to go out and talk about Michelle Wee and how she puts, then, you know, just go home. <laughs> I mean, just stop talking. I mean, this this is a woman who's, who's uh, you know, won multiple times on the LPGA Tour, and you're nowhere near her level. I mean, I think she ended up shooting a 64 when she was playing with him, and it's just ridiculous that he would even make that comment. Uh, and I mean, it's it's just something that, you know, women continue to deal with, and it just sucks. It sucks that men make these comments, and, you know, there's nothing they can do about it. They're just out there, you know, wearing what they want to wear, playing the game that they want to play, and just feeling comfortable in in the outfit that they have. Like, if that's what they want to wear, and they feel comfortable wearing it, like, we have no right to make any comments about it. <laughs> I mean, they could go out and wear what... Uh, they were wearing back in the 60s. And if that's what they want to wear and that's what women feel comfortable with, then they should be able to do it. And there shouldn't be any anybody making comments about that. If anything, you can make a comment about, you know, their game. That's it. Nothing else. These LPGA players are, are just superb and uh, just excited for their tour to kick back off. It started today, uh, the second second uh, tournament for the season. They're in the game bridge, so, and they have their Hall of Famer came back, Annika Sorenstam, she came back to play. So, there should be no, com absolutely no comments coming from the peanut gallery about what women wear. They 
have every right to wear whatever they want that they feel comfortable with. I mean, that's what this game is about. Everybody should be able to wear what they want. If they're male, female, young, old, you know, that's what makes this game approachable. You wear what you want, you feel comfortable, go out there and play. That's all that we can ask for, right? We want a game that everybody can play, everybody feels like they can go out and just pick up some clubs and play. Like, that's what we want. There should be no restrictions, and, uh, yeah. Ultimately, dress codes, uh, they just restrict the sport. Um, if you're having a private course, I get it. You have a nice prestige. You want to keep that image. But, hey, I mean, what's, what's wrong with having, you know, kids go out there and play on your course on Wednesday? Let them wear jeans on a Wednesday or... Let them wear sweatpants and, and hoodies on a Wednesday. I mean, that's what this sport is. You know, we want to grow the sport. We don't want to make it something that is unapproachable and, and people can't play. Like, you can't play because you, you don't have fancy clothes or you can't buy, you know, I mean, I'm wearing Under Armour. You can't wear Under Armour. You can't buy Under Armour. We don't want that. We want people to go out there with t shirts and play. Like, I, I mean, we're all amateurs here. We should be able to do what we want. We should be able to play wherever we want. So, and we should be able to wear whatever we want. I mean, that's how this works. That's how we grow this game. That's how we allow kids to go out and enjoy themselves. Or we allow, I mean, women to go out and enjoy themselves. I remember the experience I went on my first uh, golf uh, it wasn't a golf trip, but I went on my first golf outing with my wife, and I had no idea what she should wear. No idea. I had no idea what was appropriate. I, I mean, and what I should have said was, hey, you wear whatever you want, because, you know, ultimately you have to feel comfortable. And that's what she she told me, and I should have been supportive of that. I mean, I, I just had no idea in the time what she should be wearing. And we went out, and we played in a great course. It ended up that they aerated the course so we were pretty much playing plinko as soon as we got on to the green but she had a great time i had a great time it was like one of the best rounds i mean we ended up on the first hole we saw an alligator i mean <laughs> there's nothing nothing more i could ask for except for having fun enjoying this sport and everybody being happy with where they are with what they're wearing so ultimately dress codes i mean if you're a beginner and you're going out to go play a course, look up on the website, see if there is a dress policy. If there isn't, you should be okay with wearing what you're wearing. I mean, if somebody tells you no, then go play somewhere else. We have a course in my hometown where you can go play for free. I mean, they don't really keep it up too well and you have to walk, you get nine holes for free. Go play and you can wear whatever you want. Hoodies, sweatshirts, whatever, <laughs> who cares? I mean, I know that PGA Tour players are wearing hoodies now and I mean, not long before they're wearing sweatpants, so everybody should be able to approach this game and play this game. It's a great sport, and we all love it, and we all want to grow the sport, and we all want it to continue growing. So, dress codes, there isn't one that is documented that says everybody should ask to wear this. Each course has their own dress code. 100% of the time, if you're going to a public course, you'll probably be fine with whatever you're wearing as long as you're not wearing a bathing suit. <laughs> and private courses, you definitely need to check the policies. Uh, whoever's taking you to the private course or if you're going there by yourself, just check the website or call ahead. I mean, don't let something like a dress code put you down or stop you from playing a round of golf. So thank you guys for joining today. Uh, this is our episode on... Uh, the dress code, the attire, how it has transformed from wearing crazy thick tweed jackets to wearing paper thin shirts. <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you want to continue listening uh, to the podcast, you can check us out on Spotify. You can check us out on Apple Podcast. Uh, it's named One Iron. And uh, we hope you continue listening to us on Thursdays. I'll try to keep this going as long as I can. Next week, I think we're going to talk about rangefinders, how the USGA and is going to allow rangefinders for uh, tournaments this year. 
We're going to talk about how it might slow play, if amateurs should use them, and how we can further grow this game. So thank you for joining, and keep on listening.